I want to start with a, a thank you. The thank you is to everyone who's been involved in any way with deep adaptation or to collapse anticipation. So that is for starters, everybody on this call, because this book is a collaborative enterprise, quite obviously. But I want to emphasize that it rests on a deeper substrate of deeper resonance. In other words, this book wouldn't be happening and it wouldn't matter if there hadn't been a huge number of people who resonated when Jim put out the deep adaptation paper and who decided in one way or another to get involved. So yeah, I wanna say a thank you to everyone who's played any part in that because in some sense, this is a collaboration of all of you and all of us, this, this book that we're celebrating here today. Here's the book, by the way, if you haven't actually seen it. Yeah, it really does exist, like 3D object, brilliant. Nice and fat as well, plenty of meat. Um, and I wanted to add to that just a word on why I wanted to do this book. I was a sort of early adopter of deep adaptation in 2018, one of the earlier people, I think, to, to read the, uh, the paper in the, uh, in the sensational aftermath of its release uh, by Jem. Uh, and back in 2018, he and I first started talking about doing a book about deep adaptation. And really the reason why I wanted to is I thought this is such an important concept and it's, an, it's a concept which needs to be understood as relevant to everybody, whether or not they're convinced that collapse is inevitable, whether or not they think they have a timetable for it. And Jem, of course, has, uh, has completely come on board with, uh, with that point of view, um, that deep adaptation is for all of us who are aware that there is at the very least a possibility uh, of, uh, of societal collapse as a result of climate and uh, ecological uh, decline. Um, so yeah, that's why I wanted to, to do the book because I'm not certain that we're going to collapse and certainly not certain when it's gonna happen. But what I am certain of is that we would be absolute fools not to take deep adaptation profoundly seriously because the worst thing of all would be a collapse that we weren't in any way prepared for. But also it's interesting to, to note that I think that Jem and I have come a bit closer together in our views as the process of editing this book has proceeded. I've edited a few books over the years, uh, and I must tell you at the end of the process, you're not always as close friends with the person who you're editing with as you were at the start of the process. But in this case, we've certainly become closer friends and closer colleagues. And one of the reasons I think is that, while I don't think Jim's view of the situation has changed greatly in the last three years, my view has changed somewhat. I have become a little more um, pessimistic or if you, were, if you want realistic uh, since 2018. Uh, and I'm seeing the, the chances of our averting uh, collapse shrink as, the, uh, as the, uh, the window of time we have available uh, shrink. So perhaps that's made it uh, easy for Gemini to be uh, closer in our collaboration at the end of this process than we were at the beginning. The last thing I want to say is this, that as Katie said in her opening remarks, this is quite self-evidently a challenging topic. I hope we get to feel a little bit of that in the remainder of this hour. Uh, and for me, the phenomena of eco-anxiety and eco-grief, climate anxiety, climate grief, um, are of profound uh, importance in the kind of way that eco-psychology has helped us to understand, including, of course, the crucial work of Joanna Macy, who my teacher, who it's wonderful to see on this call uh, here today. Um, I want to add one more element to that, uh, to that mix, um, which is not talked about so much, and I think this is interesting, which is the concept of uh, eco-anger or climate anger. Um, which is itself challenging in a number of ways to consider because oftentimes we don't so much like to engage with anger because it doesn't feel so comfortable to engage with. But there's a sense, of course, in which Extinction Rebellion, the movement which has sort of emerged in a way alongside deep adaptation over the last uh, three years, uh, embodies um, that phenomenon of eco-anger or eco, uh, uh, yeah, or climate anger. Uh, and it's encapsulated in the uh, Extinction Rebellion slogan, 
love and rage, which is an interesting uh, slogan, uh, which we could discuss at length. I'm not going to do that. I simply wanted to pose that here because I think it's very interesting to, to think and go in deeper, perhaps, to the way in which at the very same time as we've had deep adaptation um, becoming a thing, we've had Extinction Rebellion and Fridays for Future becoming a thing. Uh, and I guess my view is that if we can keep all of these emotions in the mix and allow all of them to authentically presence, love and grief and fear and anxiety and anger and more besides, well, then that's placing us in a good position to deal with the very difficult things that we're going to have to deal with um, right now, but also more so in the coming years. And at the root of all those things, it seems to me, and here I'm saying something which I hope may be relatively uncontroversial with this audience, is love. The reason why we fear, the reason why we're angry, the reason, reason why we grieve is because we love. Uh, and, and that is um, a hopeful thought, even in the darkness of this time. Thanks so much, uh, Katie. Is it back to you? <laughs>